morning and welcome to Vaughn Forest Church Online. My name is Cecilia and we're so excited that you have joined us today. You picked a great day to join us online as we're continuing our message series called Social Connections, which is all about relationships and why they matter so much in our lives. Our lead pastor, Adam Bishop, will be out later in the service with today's message. Our worship team also has some incredible music that we're sure will encourage you today. Our hope and prayer is that God will meet you right where you're at, wherever you may be watching from. But before we get to that, we just have a couple of things we want to make sure you are in the know of. So many of you have let us know how useful our Vaughn Forest Church app has been. We're excited that you're enjoying it. Our app plays an important role each week in making sure that you have all the content you need to fully be part of our gatherings. In our app, we have message notes, ways for you to respond and give, videos, and more. If you have not yet downloaded our Vaughn Forest Church app, we would love for you to take this opportunity to do that. Simply search Vaughn Forest Church in the Apple Store or Google Play Store, and you can download it for free. If you have any questions or need help downloading our app, please email our staff at info at and we'll be happy to assist you. Next, in the description of this video is a link to our online connection card. You can also find the link to the connection card in our app. We would like to ask everyone to take a moment to fill that card out. All we ask from you with this card is that you fill out as much information as you feel comfortable with sharing. The great thing about our digital connection card is that if you decide that there are any next steps that you want to take today, or if you have any prayer requests to submit, you can very quickly and easily do so. We will be sure to follow up with you this week on anything that you submit. Finally, if you're viewing our live stream on social media, we would love for you to like our stream and click that share button so that your friends and family can join us as we gather today online. Our team works hard to make this gathering the best and most encouraging part of your week, and we want to include everyone in on that encouragement and on what God is doing at Vaughn Forest Church Online. Like I said earlier, we're looking forward to a great day together. We're just about ready to jump into worship. Feel free to engage in conversation in our comments section, and we'll have a pastor ready to respond to any questions, comments, or prayer requests that you may have today. Once again, thanks for joining us. Vaughn Forest Church Online starts right now. worship than with baptism. Earlier this week, we had a family uh, come and, and go with their family bat- do some baptizing, and we're going to share with that with you on video. But before that, I'd like to, uh, we want to celebrate with April and her son, Case, as April has the honor of baptizing Case. Come on out. Good morning, church. My name is April Sanford, and this is my son, Case, and he is so excited to be here today. So Case came to Sadie and I back in March, um, right about the time the quarantine started, and um, told us his desire to be baptized. So since that time, we've spent a lot of time discussing what it means to go through believer's baptism, and he has, without a shadow of a doubt, the Holy Spirit within him, and he is so excited about getting baptized today. Mm -hmm. So, Case, this is going to be a very important day for you, and we're so, so happy for you and so proud of you. And, no doubt, as a parent, it's a super emotional day for me, um, probably as emotional as the day he was born. And so, truly, this is a rebirth day for him in Christ. So, Case, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and put your faith and trust in him? Yes. All right. Upon that profession of faith... I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, hey, this is Ansley Lipscomb, and uh, Ansley is going to get baptized today. And you know what? This has been a fun season for us as a church. We're baptizing some people on Sundays. We're also baptizing some people during the week. And so Ansley's family is here to watch her get baptized today. But we're excited we can share this video with you today joining our services. And Ansley is six years old. She told me she turned six on June the 7th. And so we are so proud that Ansley's taking this step today. And baptism is how you go public with your faith. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. Children can make the decision to follow Jesus Christ as their Savior. Children can make the decision to go public with their faith. And Ansley, you are setting that example for us today by going public with your faith. We're proud of you, and as your church family, we're going to love you and pray for you and support you. And as your pastor, it is now my honor to get to baptize you as my sister in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, let's give Ansley a hand. Great job. This is Diane Casper. Yes, 
Yep. <laughs> I've been practicing, but I'm still messed up. Better known affectionately as Diane K. And so everybody knows her as Diane K. And she was telling me last night that even in the service, they called her Sergeant K sometime and other things. And so anyway, she understands that. And we all in our Sunday school class call her Diane K because that's the way we know her. And it's much easier for us Southerners, I guess, to do that. See, but we love her and we're just thankful that she's decided to follow the Lord and believe her baptism. She was raised in the Catholic faith and was baptized as a child in the Catholic Church. But since then, she's become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and she wants to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Madam, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, do you believe that Jesus was the God-man that came to earth, lived a perfect life, shed his blood, and died on the cross for your sins? Yes, I do. Have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Is it your desire to follow him all the days of your life from this forth? Yes, it is. And then because of your profession of faith in him, I will baptize you, my sister, in the Lord. In the Father, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Woo! Praise God! Amen. Well, amen, church. There is no better way to start a service than watching our friends go from death to life. Let's stand up. I'm going to read this for us. It's a Psalm 67. It says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on the earth, your salvation amongst the nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you and the nations be glad and sing for joy for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. Church, we are meant to be a blessing. God has blessed us so that we can bless others. So this morning, we're going to sing and we're going to celebrate what God's doing in our lives. And for our friends, we're going to join in and celebrate with them. Sing this with me.
God, that you stepped in in darkness. You came and made a way for us. You pulled us out of that. Through your sacrifice on the cross, God, it is by your grace and only your mercy, God, that we are standing here singing this morning because you made a way for us. God, and we are praising you for that.
promise to your children, God, to your church. God, we're thankful that we can rest in your hope that you've given us. God, and even when we don't understand what's going on, and even when we can't make sense of this, God, that we can rest in you. God, and take courage that you know exactly what's going on, and that you're working all of this for your glory. God, that you have made a way and that you have won. God, so as your church, let us stand in that. Let us stand in that promise that no matter what the enemy throws at us, no matter what this world throws at us, God, that we rest in you. God, we love you. It's in your son's holy and pleasing name, Jesus Christ. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Welcome. I'm so glad you're joining us today. Those of you guys who are at home watching online, thanks for being with us. Those of you who are here uh, worshiping with us in person on campus, it's great to see you today as well. Believe it or not, we're wrapping up this series today. It's already been four weeks. Social connection. If you're just jumping in today for the first time, here's the big idea we've kind of been unwrapping in this series. Social distancing uh, may have been good for our physical health, our spiritual health, probably not so much, because we were created for connection. We were created for fellowship, relationship, to be with one another. We teach in series, not just sermons. All of the messages are tied together. So if you've missed any of the messages in this series, let me encourage you to catch up with those on our website, uh, vaughnforest.com. They're also posted on our Vaughn Forest YouTube channel. Excited to share the concluding message of this series today. But before we do that, a couple things uh, just to hit on as a church. We uh, made this announcement last Sunday, but we have our date for our kids ministry, student ministry coming back on our campus. We're calling it Kids Come Back Sunday, Sunday, September 13th, three weeks from today, nursery, preschool, children's ministry, student ministry. They'll all be happening again here on campus at Vaughn Forest Church. It's going to be only in the 930 service. So if you're joining us online and you've been kind of waiting for that to come back before you came back, uh, make sure you come back. Did I say come back enough times there, right? At the 930 service, because that's when we're going to have it. We're going to be recording some videos to send out over the next couple of weeks, showing you all of the steps that we've taken to kind of make sure that the environments are safe for our kids, our preschoolers, our babies, our teenagers. So be on the lookout for those videos. For today, I've got an announcement to give you, kind of tied to this day. We've added a new pastor to our team, a next generation pastor. His name is Justin Daniel, and he's going to be giving leadership to the entire, that entire area of our church. So from babies through graduating high school seniors, an overall discipleship strategy process for how we're coming alongside you parents and helping you disciple your kids, disciple your teenagers. He's going to be serving with a team we already have in place, Luke, with our students, Ashley, who helps coordinate all of our volunteers, uh, Morgan, who is is our interim children's minister until we can uh, replace that position full-time. So we've got a great team in place, and Justin's going to come join that team and now lead them 
and it's going to be awesome. You're going to enjoy getting to know he and his family. So he'll be joining us on our team starting in October, but he and his family are actually going to be here on Sunday, September 13th to help us celebrate kids and students being back on our campus. And so it'll also serve as a meet and greet time for him. Now, it's going to be a safe meet and greet, all right? Maybe safely, socially distanced. You can meet him from six feet away, but it's going to be a fun time to get to know he and his family that day. And we asked them this week to kind of sit down in their home. They've got three young kids and uh, try to capture a quick little video just introducing themselves to you, our Vaughn Forest Church family. And so they did that. So take a look at this video. Hey, I'm Justin. I'm Katie. And I'm Jude. This, I'm is, the <laughs> this is Theo. <laughs> and this is Ivy. Ivy. We are so looking forward to becoming a part of the Vaughn Forest family. Uh, we're also really excited about coming up there September 13th, getting to meet everyone, and also kicking off students and kids stuff back on campus. It's going to be really, really great. And I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> and they can't wait as well. Uh, and we will see you then. Everyone say bye. 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 Their house looks about as chaotic as mine. So they got three young kids. Hey, be in prayer for them. Uh, they've got to sell a house in Mississippi before they can move here to join our team. And uh, it's going to be awesome for them to be a part of our Vaughn Forest Church family. Again, Sunday, September 13th, you'll have the opportunity to meet uh, Justin and his family in person. Keep praying for them. And uh, we'll be praying for that day as well as kids and students are back on our campus. But for today, we're going to wrap up this series. We're going to talk about how we are socially connected through committing to God's family. And over and over in the New Testament, the people of God, the followers of Jesus, the church was called the way in the first century, are described in terms and context as a family. So I'm going to give you a passage that really says that, to kind of get us off and going today, and then we're going to unpack this together today. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Here's what it says, God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory, and it was only right that he should make Jesus, through his su suffering, a perfect leader, fit to bring them into their salvation. So now, Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same Father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. If you have a Bible, and maybe you're kind of reading along at home, or if you have a Bible here in the room, I would encourage you to underline or circle this phrase— Brothers and sisters. Jesus calls us his brothers and sisters. Isn't that incredible? That if you've experienced salvation, if you've asked Jesus into your life, we celebrated baptism earlier in our service today. Baptism is how you show everyone you've made that decision. But once you've become a follower of Jesus, Jesus says you're now one of his brothers and sisters. And just as God call, just as Jesus called God his father, we now too get to call God our father because of what Jesus has done for us. And being part of God's family matters. And what we're going to talk about today is how you move from actually acknowledging, yeah, I think that as a Christian, it's kind of cool to think about I'm part of God's family, to actually crossing the line where you're making a commitment to be a part of God's family. So there are some message notes inside the app that was mentioned already. If you want to follow along with those, if you want to jot down a few things on your own, on some paper, if you're watching at home. Uh, but what I want to do is kind of walk you through what that commitment looks like today. And here's the big idea that we're going to unpack for the message. Membership is how you commit to God's family. So if we're all a part of God's family, the way that you begin to experience that, the way that you commit, and this isn't exactly a popular word, I know, so we're going to have some fun with that and maybe see biblically how this isn't such a bad thing. Membership is how you commit to God's family. Now, membership is something that's misunderstood. But in every local church, you have the opportunity to decide if you want to join the church, if you want to commit yourself to membership in the church. Now, Here's why that matters. At the end of the day, every local church is simply a family that is preparing for and expecting guests. That's what a church is. It is a family, but it's not an inwardly focused family that's not welcoming to others. It's a family that's preparing for. It's a family that's expecting guests. And, and we know this here at Vaughn Forest. In fact, since we've been back on our campus, every single service that we have had, 9, 30, 11 a.m., for seven weeks now, and we'll see if this happens again today, but so far, every service that we've had, we have had first-time guests in the room at every single service. So we're a church family, and we're glad guests join us. Maybe you're here today for the first time. We're so excited you're joining us. Maybe you're joining us online today for the first time. We're so excited you're joining us. Here's what I would love to tell you. We've prepared for you. We're expecting you. We're a family welcoming to guests. And here's the thing about the church. See, one day when we get to heaven, we will experience 
brothers and sisters in Christ, all Christians for all time. Isn't it going to be awesome that everybody who's ever experienced salvation will be physically present with us there in heaven? Brothers and sisters in Christ, the church universal. But while we're still here on this earth, in the New Testament, the church is expressed in a local context. So yes, we understand that now we've got brothers and sisters in Christ on other nations, brothers and sisters in Christ and other continents. But the way that we experience being a part of the family is in a local context, a local church like Von Forrest. The New Testament was written to local churches. Now there's not a book in the New Testament called Von Forrest, but there is a book in the New Testament called Ephesians, written to the church at Ephesus. A book called Colossians, written to the church at Colossae. And I could go through your entire New Testament and show you, other than the Gospels, that these letters were written to specific churches. So when we make a commitment to a local church, we begin to experience the benefits. And here, here's what I've observed, okay? Been a pastor for 20 years. I grew up in church before I went into full-time ministry, so I know the church drill. I, I've seen the whole thing, okay? A lot of times, here's what we tell people. Hey, you should join a church. Here's what we tell people. Membership matters. Here's what we forget to tell people. Why? Why? Like, why does it matter to join a church? Like, why is it important that we join a church? Why is it important that we commit ourselves to a family? And so what I want to do today is I want to give you four reasons. Four reasons that it's important, four benefits that we experience when we commit ourselves to God's family. So here's the first one. When you commit to God's family, here's what you can say. These are my people. These are my people. It is important to declare who your people are. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's hard to get through life. And if you haven't said, these are my people that I'm walking through life with, good luck. See, over and over in the New Testament, here's what we're told. We bear one another's burdens. We care for each other. We provide for each other. We make sure that we're there for one another. We make sure that no one's ever feeling alone. And I want to read for you a passage of Scripture from Ephesians. It's a passage of Scripture that I think a lot of Christians have heard because it talks about the full armor of God. It's a pretty famous passage, Ephesians chapter 6, 13 through 17. So I'm going to read this. And, and, and there'll be some things you've seen here before, but then after I read it, I want to point out something that maybe you've never noticed about this passage and how it's tied to the importance of us claiming who our people are. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with what? The belt of truth, buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil ones. You know that the evil one, the enemy, Satan, and all of his demons, they are firing arrows at you day after day after day. So you've got to have this shield of faith. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What a great passage. If you've got kids, I would challenge you to challenge them to memorize this passage of Scripture. If you're a teenager, I would challenge you to memorize this passage of Scripture. The evil one is after you. He's out to attack. And God has equipped us. God has given us armor. But here's the thing about this passage. There's one part of us that the armor of God does not protect, and it's our back. All of those things, you can put on the helmet, you can have the breastplate of righteousness, you can have your belt of truth, you can have your sword, but guess where you're exposed? Your back. That's why God gave us each other. See, as fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, we have to get one another's back. And we can go through life with all of the things that we just read about, but if we don't have people with us, for us, protecting us, getting our back, make no mistake about it, we are leaving ourselves vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. Here's the second benefit from committing yourself to God's family. You acknowledge that my spiritual growth is a community service project. I love this principle. In fact, if you've listened to me preach for some time, you've heard me say this over and over and over because I think it's that important. So I'm circling back around to it again. That my spiritual growth, your spiritual growth, is a community service project. If you care about what the New Testament says, you got to care about spiritual growth. See, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, he saves us just as we are. Praise God. But guess what we're called to? Growing to become more like Jesus. There should be a noticeable difference about our lives the longer we walk with the Lord. That growing in godliness matters. But here's the thing. All spiritual growth happens in the context of relationships. If you isolate yourself as a Christian, you cannot grow. If you remove yourselves from biblical community, you cannot grow. 
and growth matters. Now again, I want to read a passage. You've heard this before. It's kind of a famous passage, but I want to point out why it matters to be connected into God's family when it comes to this passage. Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the fruit of the Spirit, the things that should be noticeable about us if the Holy Spirit dwells within us. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self Control. Here's what this passage means. If someone follows you around for a week with a clipboard and a pen, I guess we can't use that anymore because, you know, you transfer terms. So they follow you around with a week with an app, and, and they took notes on your life. Are these the words they would describe your behaviors by? This is what's challenging about this passage. All of these words describe our actions, and they describe our behaviors. Now, here's the truth. As a follower of Jesus, I am not the person who gets to determine whether or not these things are present in my life. As a follower of Jesus, you, whether you're here on campus, whether you're joining us online, you're not the person that gets to make that call. Other people get to make that call. My wife and my kids get to determine whether or not I have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The team I serve with here at Vaughn Forest, they're the ones that get to make that call. Is my life demonstrating love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? The, the, the governance board that I serve with, the, the lay leadership team of our church, they're the ones that get to make that determination. See, the people who are close to you, the people who really know you, they're the ones that get to make that call. Spiritual growth happens in the context of relationship, and if we want our lives to reflect the fruit of the Spirit, we have to willingly choose to commit ourselves to being in relationships with one another. Number three, here's the third benefit. It clarifies authority and accountability. Now, aren't these popular words, right? Aren't you glad you came to church? Authority and accountability. Those are not words that most of us get really excited about. Let's just be honest for a second. But if we care about what the New Testament says, we should care about these two words. See, authority matters. Authority matters. It's not popular for us to talk about authority, but read through the New Testament. See, authority matters. And here's, here's, a, here's a truth, just as kind of for free. If you ever find yourself in life in a place where there's no authority over you, be very careful. You're now very vulnerable to the attacks from the enemy. See, God's in favor of authority in our lives. Authority sometimes doesn't feel great, but it produces godliness. And all of us are in authority. I mean, in the context of a local church, we're placing ourselves under authority. I'm under the authority of our governance board. I just can't do whatever I want to willy-nilly, and that is a good thing. So authority happens in a healthy way in a local church. Accountability happens in a healthy way. I mean, think about what we just talked about, the fruit of the Spirit. It's important to be committed to a group of people that can help hold you accountable. Not in like a hyper-spiritual, beat you up, act like they've got it all together and you're a bum kind of way. It's the kind of thing where if there's something happening in your life, you've got somebody who can come along, you put their arm around you, even in a you know, socially distanced way, maybe they put their arm around you six feet away, but they kind of put their arm around you and they say, hey man, listen. Maybe, you know, you could use a little encouragement there. I kind of heard the way you were talking. It sounded a little sharp. It sounded a little harsh. I'm here for you. It, it's a loving way of providing accountability. Now, there's a verse that kind of talks about this. Maybe you've heard it before. Maybe you haven't. But we started in the book of Hebrews today. Let me circle back around to the book of Hebrews. And I think this verse is helpful for us to see as followers of Jesus. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that will be no advantage to you. Now, I'll leave this up here for a second because I want to talk about this. It says, obey your leaders, submit to their authority. If you're a follower of Jesus and you want to obey Scripture, you, you've got to wrestle with this passage. You've got to wrestle with this passage because the question becomes, well, who's my leader and whose authority are we talking about here? If you've never chosen to commit yourself to a particular family of God, a particular local church, there's a lot of ambiguity with this. So let's just say a pastor goes on the news tonight, and he goes, all Christians should. I'm a pastor. He quotes this verse, and he says, Christians, this is what you should do because I'm a leader, and you're under my authority. Does that apply to you? It's a good question to consider. Here's what I would say. If you've declared who your leaders are, then no. When you make the commitment to become a part of a local fellowship, you've declared who your leadership is. Now, if your leadership starts doing something that is different from God's word, which Paul, Paul said in his letters, hey, everything I'm saying, make sure it matches up to God's word, then you have the choice to, to choose to either remove those leaders or to choose to remove yourself to go somewhere where you can trust the leadership. Now, this matters. For those of us who serve in leadership, this matters because he, what it says is that we have to give an account 
We have to give an account. When, when I read that, I get really nervous. Because, see, I take God's word seriously. So what that says is one day I have to give an account. And my question is, Lord, an account of who? An account of who? And what I understand this passage to be saying is an account of those who you've been entrusted to lead by serving them the most. Those who are part of the flock. Those who have committed to be a part of the family. And see, so this matters. And, and when we commit to be a part of God's family, here's what we do. We bring clarity where maybe before there was ambiguity. And now a lot of the passages that we read in Scripture, we begin to see practically how we can begin to step into obeying them. Here's the fourth benefit, and this is the one I think is the most important. We get to celebrate unity over uniformity. When you choose to commit to God's family through membership, you now can celebrate unity over uniformity. Here's the thing. When we follow Jesus, that is what unifies us. Far too often, churches are more interested in uniformity than unity. I'm not trying to talk bad about churches. I'm, I'm just trying to keep it real this morning. Uniformity is where you produce cookie-cutter Christians, where everybody looks the same, everybody talks the same, everybody acts the same, everybody thinks the same. And that is not the picture we see of the church in the first century in the New Testament. In fact, I want to give you a scripture reference, Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4 Verses 10 through 14. Now, I'm not going to read the passage because it would take way too long to read. And I actually unpacked this passage in great detail back when we we're doing our daily devotions, okay? But I want to point out the most important part of this. If you know anything about Colossians, by the time you get to verse 10 of chapter 4, we're getting close to the end of the letter. Paul's just rattling through a bunch of names, and it's easy to kind of disengage at that part. Well, he's just kind of mentioning a bunch. It's like the, it's like the, the scripts at the end of a movie, kind of rolling up the screen. I don't, I don't know if I need to read that. He's just reading a bunch of names. But in giving us names, and in giving us the context of the names, Paul says a ton. At the end of his letter, Paul mentions six names, if I can pronounce them all correctly. Aristarchus, Mark, and Justice, Epaphras, Luke, Demas, And he sets them off as three names that he talks about, sets them apart as three names he talks about, and then three names he talks about. Here's why he does this, two categories of names. He says in the closing of his letter, hey, these three guys, these three guys, they're Jews. Hey, these three guys, they're not, they're Gentiles. And, and what's Paul doing? He's doing a couple things. First of all, he's showing us that he has people who are completely different on his inner circle of leadership. These are six men who are helping him accomplish the mission he's been called to. See, it's one thing to say the gospel in the first century helped Jews and Gentiles become followers of Jesus. It's quite another thing to give specific names to men who are on your inner circle of leadership. And we take that for granted. We cannot imagine, we cannot imagine what it meant to have three Jews and three Gentiles and that close of a proximity to Paul. They hated each other. I mean, everything about their world said there's no way you could have three Jews and three Gentiles in the inner circle. But here's what Paul wants everybody to say. We're unified. We're unified because of Jesus. But here's the thing. There's not uniformity happening here. He goes out of his way to tell the church at Colossae, yeah, these three guys are Jews and, and these three guys aren't. We know from Scripture that Mark... John Mark is somebody that Paul had a conflict with a decade earlier. We know when we read 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Timothy, that Demas was somebody that Paul had conflict with later, after this book. Here's what I want you to see. This was not like this perfect little world where everybody skipped through fields and, and held hands and smelled flowers. That's not what the church looked like. There was friction. There was conflict. There was not uniformity. There was lots of differences, but they were unified. And because they were unified, the gospel message advanced like it never has since. In the midst of circumstances that should have caused problems, the gospel message continued to advance. See, here's what happened in the first century. The differences that existed among these six guys, let's throw this back up here, the differences did not cause division. So key. The differences did not cause division. They were unified but they still acknowledge their differences. See, here's the thing, church. When, when you're a part of a local church that's unified around Jesus Christ, it allows for greater diversity, not less. When, when you're in a local church that's unified around Jesus Christ, it allows for stories to be shared more openly, not hid in the shadows. See, when believers acknowledge our unity comes from Jesus and Jesus alone, here's what that means. People of different backgrounds different cultural backgrounds, different family backgrounds, 
different ethnicities, different races, they don't have to check that at the door in order to be unified. It's the differences that bring a richer understanding of what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. See, when I spend some time with a brother in Christ who grew up differently than me, who looks different than me, who has a different family background than me, who sees the world different than me, but he's still my brother in Christ because we're unified in Jesus, I leave that conversation better. I leave that conversation with a broader perspective of what it means to follow Jesus. I leave that conversation with a greater understanding of people who are different than me. See, the greatest witness and testimony to our community isn't that we all look alike, sound alike, smell alike, sing alike. The greatest witness to our community is immense differences that don't get in the way of our unity. And church, make no mistake about it. To a lost and dying world, that matters. See, in the first century, if you were a Jew or you were a Gentile, that was a difference that could not be overcome. And yet it kept being overcome by these people who were following Jesus. There's just something attractive about that. It hasn't changed. In the 21st century, when there are followers of Jesus who differences don't create division. Differences make us better. Seeing the world differently isn't something that gets in the way of our fellowship. It actually builds and strengthens our fellowship. Make no mistake about it. There is an attractiveness to our world today where all of those things create problems and friction and division. And when you choose to commit yourself to being a part of a local church, where you get to rub shoulders with people who are different than you, who have all been saved by the same Savior, man, it brings a richness to your life. It brings a richness to your fellowship. It brings a richness to your understanding of what it means to follow Jesus that you're gonna miss out on if you don't take that step. Would you join me as we pray together today? Jesus, I wanna start this prayer by just asking that you would continue to protect our unity here at Vaughn Force Church. Lord, I'm grateful that we do have a church that's diverse. We don't all look the same. We're not all the same age. We're not all the same color. We don't all have the same background. We all didn't grow up in the same part of the country or the same part of the world. Lord, I'm grateful that we have diversity here in our church family. But God, I also know that what holds that unity together is you. And what holds that unity together is us moving forward together in humility. So Lord, we just want to pray collectively as a church family that we would continue to do that. Lord, I want to pray for maybe the brothers and sisters in Christ who maybe they've kind of gone through a season where they feel a little bit kind of like a Lone Ranger Christian. They don't really know who their people are. They don't really know who is the person who can put an arm around them and give them some encouragement. They feel kind of alone right now. They don't feel like they have people behind them. They don't feel like they have people who are getting their back. Lord, my prayer is that maybe because of this message, they would take a step either here towards Vaughn Forest or maybe they're joining us online and there's another local church where they live and they can connect there with a, a body as well. Lord, that being a part of your family matters. And Lord, may all of us who are part of the family do our part to love and serve and bear one another's burdens. And so Lord, we thank you that you've given us each other, that we don't have to walk through life alone. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining us online today at Vaughn Forest Church. I hope that the service was a blessing to you. I hope the message challenged you as we talked about taking the commitment to be a part of God's family formally through membership. Now, I want to point out a couple of next steps in your app on the connection card uh, tied directly to the message today. First, you'll see we have a next, step, next Steps class one week from today on our campus. Now, this is how you become a member at Vaughn Forest. You go through this class and uh, you make that decision. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're ready to take that next step. Uh, go ahead and mark it. We'll follow up you this week, let you know a bit more details about what that'll look like on our campus. The other next step is for a Discover Vaughn Forest virtual style, Zoom style. We had just started these for new people at our church, and uh, then we had to shut it all down with everything with coronavirus. But maybe you've been connecting with us online, and we've never even spoken, either over screen or in person. Maybe you had just kind of started attending Vaughn Forest earlier this year, and uh, you're still trying to figure out the best way to get connected. We'd love to kind of bring all of you together at once. We're going to figure out a date, and we're going to figure out a time based on feedback from you. So if you're interested in that, mark that next step. It'll be about 45 minutes. Our whole team will be on there. We just want to share with you a little bit more about who we are as a church, our history, uh, where we believe God's calling us to go in the future, and then obviously we want to get to, get to know you some as well so you can mark that next step hey lots of fun things happening hopefully you picked up on it in the service today one kids come back sunday in just a few weeks sunday september 
13th. Until then, our children's ministry team continues to do a great job uh, sending you resources each week. There is now a preschool specific video for your preschoolers and then an elementary specific video for elementary school students. Those are posted on our website or you can get them directly into your email box. Luke, our student pastor, is already starting to connect with some students on Wednesday nights outside in preparation for uh, the 13th, Sunday, September 13th. So if you got a teenager, you want a little bit more about that, just write students on the, or type students on the app, on the connection card, and the prayer request line will follow up you that. And then uh, you saw Justin, Daniel, his wife Katie, their three kids. He's joining our team as our next generation pastor. Really excited to have him as a part of the team. Be in prayer for them as they continue to transition, moving from Mississippi uh, to join us here in Montgomery. Um, they are going to start in October, but they're going to be here with us on Sunday, September 13th for Kids Come Back Sunday. A meet and greet, safely, socially distanced, and so hopefully you'll be able to be here, not just for that day, for your kids, for your students, but also to get to meet Justin and his family. Finally, let me say thank you for your giving. That's what makes everything we do as a church possible. Many of you give through the app. Many of you give through vonforest.com. However you give, know it's how we're offering hope. And this idea of offering hope is essential to who we are as the followers of Jesus. And we're going to spend some time talking about that in our next teaching series. And I'm excited to kick off with you next Sunday. It's called Recapturing Hope. And I believe we're entering into a season, church, where we need to lead the way and show our community what it looks like to recapture hope. See, we had a lot of hope at the beginning of the year. It was a new year. It was a new decade. And then all of a sudden, obviously, everything with coronavirus kind of put us all in a little bit of a rut. And here's the thing. As followers of Jesus, we don't wait till circumstances change to recapture our hope because we have hope right now because of the resurrection. And not only do we have hope, we've been called to offer hope. And I'm really excited to share with you in this series some tangible ways our church is going to be offering hope here locally in our community. Some tangible ways our church is going to be offering hope globally. So hopefully you don't miss the kickoff of this series next Sunday, Recapturing Hope, 9.30 a.m., 11 a.m. Hey, one last thing. If today's message encouraged you, can I encourage you to share it with a friend? Share it through social media. Share it however you choose to digitally because there's a good chance there's someone you know who could also use a little bit of encouragement in their life. Hey, no, I miss seeing you in person, but I am so grateful that you continue to join us online. Can't wait to be back with you next Sunday as we kick off Recapturing Hope. Until then, I hope you have a great week.